So we have Maryam and Sufra, and we have Nihal and Taibi. Nihal is the founder of Taibi. And she is as determined, if not more, as Maryam. Thanks for joining me, Nihal. And next we have Professor Yildiz Atasar. She's a professor of sociology at SFU and the director of the Center for Sustainable Development. Thank you. And then we have Mahi Khala from the Immigration Services Society of BC Settlement uh, of the BC Settlement Program. Thank you. And we're lucky to be joined by Eva Braunstein, the Tiny Film Director. Uh, a little bit of some bad news. Uh, Russia Youssef was supposed to join us, and she's also from the Immigration Services Society. Unfortunately, uh, there's an emergency in Syria with her family. Uh, just this, this afternoon, when she texted me before we started to say she's not able to join. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have a great uh, panel here, and uh, I'm going to moderate the, the, the session and ask you some questions, and then we'll give you some time to also ask us some. Uh, so first, uh, Nihal, I'll start with you, because uh, I remember saying, you should see this, and I think you'll find some connection. And I remember you said, I love it. Can you tell us more about what you loved about it, and what kind of connections you find between both? Um, I don't know if it's on. Yeah. It is on. Uh, thanks, Alex. Yeah, I think um, you sent me the link. Um, Taibe was about a year old at the time, or a, a little older than a year. Um, I remember I was in Ottawa in the winter visiting family, had nothing to do. Emma sent me the link, and I must have started watching the movie at midnight, and I was mesmerized. I, I, I just couldn't believe the parallels between the movie and what we were experiencing in, uh, in, uh, in Taibe. Um, from working with a wonderful uh, group of dynamic, active, ambitious women who want to overcome their circumstances and you know find an opportunity to a better life, to thinking of food as a medium for improving one's life and for accessing a community that is outside of what your community is at the moment, um, the obstacles that uh, they were going through and that we were going through not identical, but also facing obstacles, uh, starting a new business with a group of new arrivals um, centered around food that is also new to the city. And uh, I believe I saw a lot of, uh, of myself in Maryam. Um, her sheer determination, um, her nervousness and anxiety, and really wanting to do things well. Um, and the connection that she had with her ladies, I, 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 I like to think that I have a similar connection with the Taibe ladies as well. So um, when Emma sent me the, the link to the movie, I watched it and I'm like, this is a beautiful film. It's so moving, it's so emotional, it tells so much, and I'm delighted you guys shared it with us. Um, I mean, we have, uh, in both cases, a success story, right? But, uh, you would like, I mean, you have a certain experience with the work you do. And before we get to success, what kind of challenges refugees have been facing coming here and finding a place uh, using their skills? First of all, thank you for inviting me. This is amazing. Both movies are amazing. Um, I think it's important to, to start off by saying that settlement agencies like Immigrant Services Society of BC or other settlement agencies are funded by the Canadian government to help settle refugees and newcomers. Um, and the the reality with the Syrian operation Syria and, and, and the refugees that came is that there was a multitude of barriers. First of all, language is a huge issue. Um, one of the statements that was that in the, in the table of documentary by one of the ladies is um, Syrians are um, resilient. They are. And anywhere they move to in transition countries, be it Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, they're able to work and they're able to 
and I, I feel that's the major barrier um, that kind of uh, inhibits their ability to, to quickly get into um, kind of being productive within their new community. But also, they are also constantly thinking about their loved ones. They've been separated from loved ones. You can't really move on with your life and uh, really, you know, like, get productive if you're constantly thinking about what's happening to your family in Syria, like Michael who is not here today, or um, like some of the ladies from Taiba also are thinking about their um, children and other countries. So those are the two main barriers um, that we try, or we see a lot and we try and help uh, you know. Mahia, I have a question about um, what resources you have to actually kind of make it easier for women specifically to, to achieve their goals? So for, for women specifically, um, we provide support services um, in terms of just kind of trying to help them understand the system and how to navigate it um, in first language. Uh, we've also realized as the kind of the first initial year passed um, uh, that there's a need for more and we kind of re-approached our, or approached some more donors and, and were able to convince them that there, for instance, is a need for um, trauma counseling in first language for um, uh, newcomers from Syria, from other um, refugees from other countries also. So we <coughs> launched a pilot project for that, which has been very successful. We're hoping that it will, um, within this year, show even more success that it can be uh, grown into a full-fledged project, because um, there's definitely a need. Um, usually trauma starts really appearing after a year of settling in your new country, um, so, so that's been helpful. We are also um, provide employment services uh, support just to, again, navigate, help um, newcomers, you know, the basic stuff, you know, write up a resume, how to kind of tell yourself to an employer, but again, with language barriers, that becomes very hard, and we are forced to try and support them find kind of language, like jobs that don't require much language. But it's a kind of a catch-22 because if they're in those jobs, they're not learning the language either. So it's it's interesting in that sense. We have a women's support program which Russia works on also, uh, which is a peer support group that allows you know usually allows women to just learn more about Canada and. You know, uh, upgrade their skills in general to be comfortable in their in new community. We have a volunteer and community connection program which is pr provides, part of it is a mentorship program that allows, kind of matches newcomers with long-time Canadians, uh, regardless of language. Um, so basically it, it provides the newcomer an opportunity to interact, interact with a long-time Canadian and befriend them. And usually it's a, supposed to be a three months commitment by the volunteer, but in most cases it lasts longer, they become part of the family, they they share food and meals, and, and it, it usually, you know, they lasts for a much longer than the initial three months, or is renewed over and over, beyond us also, the nation. Uh, Nihal, uh, you know, at the beginning in the film, uh, Mariam says every refugee has a dream, and my question to you is what has been um, the most challenging thing you faced to realize it, this dream, but also the most inspiring, encouraging act or that, that, that kept you going or has been keeping you going? Let me start by what kept us going. Yes. <laughs> um, I really think what kept us going is Just tasting that level of that success and seeing the reaction from the community since our very first pop up dinner. Our very first pop up dinner happened in October of 2016. It was a small dinner for 50 people. It sold out in a day. It was an invitation on Facebook. It sold out in a day. We didn't know what to expect, and it was supposed to be a one time thing, and there was no typing at the time. But the level of support and enthusiasm and generosity and love that we got from the guests and the encouragement that we got, number one. And number two, the excitement that the ladies exhibited. It, it was as if they were here, kind of like not knowing what to do, and then 
that dinner happened, they loved the experience so much and they wanted more. And I think with every passing dinner and then launching Taipei catering and with the food truck and every single step that we've taken, I, I, I think I see it with the ladies we work with, I see the hunger for more. It's exceeding my own ambitions, to be honest. And we started off with, you know, wanting to do catering and so on, and then now they were like, we want to open a restaurant, we want our products on the shelf, we want everybody to recognize the brand. And it's that that desire, you know, that really fuels, um, fuels us to keep moving forward and overcome whatever obstacles we face. Um, in terms of obstacles that you mentioned, it's really the regular things that face any um, new business. I, myself, am one of the obstacles. I don't come from a background in the food industry. My background is in anthropology and development studies. So I'm, I'm learning as I go. Um, the only thing I've done throughout my career was to work with um, uh, women in the Middle East. My career was in gender uh, and women's issues. And so that is the area I'm most passionate about. So the business aspect, we're learning as we go. Uh, of course, other smaller impediments are the language barriers that um, that many talked about, you know. Uh, but even the opportunity to be in the kitchen where we work with commissary, connect and be surrounded by other uh, businesses that we share the space with, forces the ladies to learn English and to practice and to have to coexist with Canadians and speak to them and negotiate the ovens and the ranges and all of these things. So just by being thrown in the thick of running a business, we slowly, bit by bit, chip away at these little impediments, which, and just seeing the level of confidence, self-confidence that the ladies exhibit now, compared to two years ago, is in itself very, very inspiring, and I think it pushes me to just keep going and hope for more. Thank you. Um, Eva, what made you uh, decide to do this documentary, you've heard about Faye before, and so what was the inspiration, and what was it like to actually be with them, you know, filming that and filming that, putting this documentary together? There's a moment. <laughs> um, well, I actually just heard about Taipei through the Facebook conversation that Michal mentioned, and it really struck my interest for two reasons, one being Syria food, and having really heard of Syria food, and I was intrigued. And the second just being that it was an initiative run by women, um, empowering women, and really sh sharing a different story than we often see about the refugee experience. Um, so I was really interested, I reached out to Michal, and then over a period of about six months, we came up with a strategy, and then uh, we're really lucky to be supported by Story Hive, um, with a small grant to create the piece. And then the second part of the question, what, it, what was it like to be with them, filming them, cooking, and telling you the stories that are also very intimate stories about their loved ones, about Celia, uh, you know, the whole trauma as well. I know she ate a lot. <laughs> 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 and first, it was just being grateful. Um, I would always find snacks, which was great. Um, but yeah, it was really struck, at the, struck by their warmth and their generosity. It's an incredible offering to give their time and their stories and I was really honored um, that they shared it with me. Um, I learned so many things about Syria. The memories are so beautiful and that really struck me and was something that I hope to, to get across in the film. Um, but it was also to show that it's a, it's a complex process and luckily as it should be tied in, received a good amount of attention in the media which is great um, and I wanted to further that by looking a little bit deeper at the daily struggles and triumphs of what it's like to live in Canada. Uh, Professor Atta, so I know you love the movie as well, mm -hmm. but um, you wish there was something in it, right? And uh, you find there was something missing that you, you'd like to talk about. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you for coming here as well, but for uh, viewing this film and sharing our uh, ideas. Uh, before I answer your question, actually, I would like to give some data. In 2017, there were 458 million uh, international uh, migrants, uh, refugees actually, I'm sorry, migrants in the world. 
and they represented their three percent of the world's population, which is normal. It's an expected number. Uh, but what's interesting is that actually there are there were in 2017 25.9 million refugees. This is unusual. And the, the other unusual part of that is that is this 60% uh, of these refugees are from Syria, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and Afghanistan. And 30% of them are from Syria, 11.7% uh, is uh, from uh, South Sudan, 10% from uh, Central African Republic, and 7.2% are from uh, Afghanistan. So when we think about these numbers, especially given that 60% of these refugees are from these countries, the first thing comes to our mind is war. But in fact, actually, um, even though I mean, the war is ongoing in Syria, in other places, the most important reason why these people are displaced is drought, uh, the lack of access to food, or water stress that they experience in their uh, lives. So in this aspect of the film, it was about the food, but it didn't get into uh, food relationships as related to uh, climate change and why there is a uh, water problem, why there is a uh, drought problem as linked to the industrialization of food production. I mean, this film is all these tomatoes, uh, red, bright colored tomatoes. I wonder where these tomatoes came from. It, it most likely came from Turkey and it produced in, in industrial ways. So it's a very complicated issue, and that's one part of the things that we didn't see, how the uh, food catering, and also uh, the inclusion of food truck in the food business played a part in terms of the whole long chain of food relationships. And there's this downstream, upstream includes all you know, uh, the, the technology companies, biotechnology companies, supermarkets, etc., and labor. Etc. So we did not see all these hidden parts of the food relationships. That is one. And the other one is that, um, as um, you were also talking about, uh, the Miriam is a social entrepreneur. She somehow, we don't know how, because we didn't, we, we were not told about this. She had relationships, connections with some groups in Europe. Uh, and they get money through donations, uh, which is uh, fine. Uh, but at the same time, we don't know who is an uh, employer, who is an employee, what kind of relationship did emerge. Is this a call? Is this, a, uh, is this based on sharing everything? Or is, is there a relationship employment? And uh, these were not discussed at all. And that was something for me that it brought me, um, it, it, it made me to think about the um, uh, neoliberal philosophy of uh, individuals taking responsibility for their well-being. That is fine. It, it, it has two sides to it. One is that it empowers people when they feel that actually they are taking charge of their life uh, to earn income, to support their families. And they are getting together. They love that. I mean, they, they are sharing all kinds of ideas, uh, recipes, etc. But the other side of that is the disciplining aspect of it. Uh, these, um, uh, the, the making of the food and selling it through a variety of ways uh, were informal enough. The, the, women, uh, the, the women's work were not registered. They are not covered in any kind of social security networks at all. So, um, and long hours. And these people, uh, many of them were married with children. They are working long hours in a rather ambiguous uh, way, but we don't know how they are managing their domestic work, how they are negotiating the domestic side of their work with their partners, husbands, brothers, fathers, etc. So, uh, the, this is only one man, husband. Uh, he described the situation as a matter of uh, her, I mean, his wife of supplementing, supporting the family. Her income was supplementary. 
but we also saw other kind of women. I mean, we didn't say they were uh, husbands, but uh, they were extremely fools. Um, so they were not supplementing any kind of family, I believe, but they were actually surviving, maybe through the wages. And there, there, there are two different groups of women emerging from these relationships, and how they do negotiate their uh, survival strategies with their partner, with their families, what happens to children, and child care. And uh, when I think about all these things, I felt that actually in the absence of the state, the government, to provide any kind of assistance, social services, etc., we saw the devolving of a refugee crisis uh, into in individual responsibilities. People, women are taking responsibility, but the outcome of two sides of outcome empowerment and extreme disciplining perhaps and that may result in um, I, I don't know what may be but we will see at the end but at least there are lots of ambiguities that we did not see addressed in the film nevertheless so we don't expect we, we shouldn't expect the stand film to cover every aspect of these issues and concerns but at least it, it, there's something for us to think about empowerment may be a good thing but the other side of that, that we should also think about. Uh, empowerment via markets is something, but empowerment via uh, acquiring more rights is something else. That is my concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Especially, I mean, those concerns become even more highlighted in the context of then the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, no citizenship, no, politic, no formal political representation. <coughs> I mean, we talked earlier about assimilation. Actually, maybe it's easier here, because language is the bar barrier, but the policies are there. The, the framework is there, but in the context of Lebanon, they're set, and that's it. it, it it's a very complicated situation. So um, I'll turn to you and let you ask questions before we eat. <laughs> uh, we will have mics around. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering what the structure is of your tie group and also where the funding came for the food truck.
non-profit, sorry to cut you off, but the, the, the project within that non-profit supports this, uh, this, this enterprise, supports SOPRA. So they're all part of that non-profit, that project. It's an NGO. Yeah. And, and this is typical in terms of the Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Uh, so the Lebanese state has no responsibility towards the camps except, let's say, security, etc. Again, I mean, Maria was talking about the refugee being a security issue. So you find a lot of NGOs, uh, specifically European NGOs, working uh, with the Palestinians in the refugee camps. Uh, so this is very common in terms of how the project started. May I add something to it? Uh, the, in the English uh, translation of the film, I didn't get that I feel in the refugee from an NGO. Uh, even though I, I realized that actually the money was uh, mobilized through the EU connection, and that is the NGO connection perhaps, but also we have to be just careful about the role of NGOs as well. So uh, NGOs may be a vehicle to start certain social enterprising projects, but at the same time, uh, the issue of um, uh, the ambiguity of how they are paid, what's going to happen is still there, it's a big question. I'm planning on going to Lebanon, looking for Maria. <laughs> so we have a question. We actually all call it for now. But there was a European Fund Foundation. Yeah. yeah. And I have to say, um, uh, the, the state may not be you know, doing uh, or supporting the refugee camps, but there are a lot of Lebanese associations that work with the Palestinians in the camps. I just want to follow on a question about the structure of Kayla. Maybe it's quite easy that the Syrian chefs are employees of the company, I think the perception that we have in the media is this is a, an enterprise by Syrian refugees. So who then is the owner of the corporation and who um, handles the business operations and the business decisions? Yeah. So I do. I handle the business decisions. And the reason, so I'll tell you why we went down that road. At the very beginning, uh, after the first few pop-up dinner events, we sat down with the ladies and had and with the non-profit routes, uh, it was understood and agreed that we would have to seek uh, continuous funding to keep this operation going. At the same time, we are aware of several similar initiatives that happen around Canada, specifically with uh, Syrian refugee women, uh, that were uh, set up as non-profit. And uh, for various reasons, uh, these enterprises are really struggling at the moment. Part of it, I, I think, or my reading of the situation is that maybe the wave of attention to this uh, uh, crisis is starting to fade. Maybe it's uh, sort of the, the political leaning is changing. I'm not sure. But the, the fact of the matter is, uh, a lot of these enterprises now are desperate. And I think, uh, I'm actually very glad that we read the situation as such at the time, and that we decided that Taibe is gonna become uh, a for-profit, and it's gonna be, be able to compete with catering companies, restaurants, in its own right. We are not looking for grants or handouts. We have to offer top-notch, top-quality food and service, and people will come to us not because they feel sorry for us. It's because of the quality of the service that we offer. And that's why I'm saying in the span of a year and a half, we've become a self-sustaining operation. And our regulars keep coming back to us, not because, because you know, if people start, feel sorry for you, or they want to give you a hug, they'll come once. But if what you offer is not great, they won't come back. But the fact that people keep coming back and that our network of clients is growing and growing and growing, Organically, we've never spent a penny on marketing or advertising. It's just a te testament to the quality of the food and the service. So as far as I can see, I'm, I'm very glad we took that route instead of the non-profit route that is quite precarious.
want to more, but I was wondering if there's going to be a revisiting of the topic and maybe expanding it into a larger film. Well, this may be a nice opportunity to, to um, make one announcement and a potential announcement. The first announcement is that now we're working on a Thai cookbook. And so, um, hopefully, hopefully, like 2020, you guys will be able to see this beautiful book that combines recipes and also the stories of the lives of the Thai ladies. And that we've also been approached by several movie directors who would like to produce a whole feature about Thai that's still in the works, but hopefully um, we'll have good news about that. So thank you for having me.
question as much as expanding on the dialogue here. Uh, I put the word uh, social debt, and uh, maybe a big burden also is financial debt. So I have worked, you know, with nonprofits or you non know, nonprofit uh, societies, and if someone steps up, say they're the director of the nonprofit, uh, they have the responsibility to work with the group in that positive way, but they also have that responsibility of financial debt. And so if they are like trying to work for the families and they're worried about sort of uh, economic debt, um, they could well not want to take that responsibility of debt as well. And that's been you know, part of the conversation that I've heard on being like directors of nonprofit society. Uh, so I, you know, so that conversation about where to go of whether it's a limited company or whether it's a co-op, that's part of that like, internal conversation, first of all, for the individual. And I think that becomes that uh, the bigger conversation for the community. Uh, so there certainly has been a lot of food for thought. I wanted to maybe acknowledge CBC. Uh, they covered uh, this. That's why I'm here today. Yeah. Um, so you. there's so many ways to connect with the community. Uh, you know, food for stomach, food for thought. Yeah. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>